Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Allen, for the invitation, Dr. Bailey, for allowing me to come. This is a highlight, and uh, I thank you for it. Whether you realize it or not, uh, this is really uh, a prime time in your life. You're probably so anxious to get the degree and get on out, whatever, but I'm telling you, soak it up and enjoy it. Because once you get out there in ministry, there are bad people. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean that. Uh, they're not going to come at you primarily from the ungodly people outside the church. It's going to be the ones in the church that's going to come for you. Uh, we have had uh, the privilege of a lot of young people called in the ministry during our times as pastor. And it gives me great delight when that happens, but also it makes me shudder because I know what's in store for them. I think about it kind of like the sea turtles. You know, they go and lay thousands of eggs, and thousands of those little turtles uh, hatch, and they begin to make their way to the water. And as they're making their way uh, to the water, there are birds, just flocks of birds waiting for them and just scooping down and eating them up. And uh, a huge number of them never make it to the water. The ones that make it to the water, there's schools of fish waiting for them. And so just a handful out of a thousand actually make it. In ministry, I've been told, and, and I pretty much agree, about one in 20 who start out in ministry actually finish in the ministry. Because there's a lot of birds and a lot of fish that will, will eat you alive. Um, I remember, uh, I know we're at chapel, and you kind of have to be here, right? <laughs> and that's good, because if you didn't have to, I know where you'd be at the coffee shop right now. <laughs> but uh, when I was at Southwestern, it was, chapel was optional, and I did try to go because I love to hear preaching. And so one particular time I went in, uh, not expecting a whole lot to happen that day, and I noticed it was a little bit larger crowd than normal, and um, they announced who the speaker was, and I looked at him, and he was like a real old man with a really big black Bible in his hand, and he'd written like 30-something books. And I thought, mm, I'm out of here, dude. The last thing I need to hear is an old man who's written 30-something books. Well, the lady began to sing, and uh, I kind of was in the middle of an aisle of a, of a pew, and I thought, I'll, I'll go ahead and stay. And so the little man started walking with the little man's steps. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so he got there, and he began to preach. And as he began to preach, I just got closer and closer to the edge of my seat. And I found myself praying and asking God if he would let me live that long, I would like to be like that old man. I found out later the old man's name was Vance Havner. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Amen. So off uh, I went, and uh, the second church that I pastored, uh, I was about to become one of those little turtles that got eaten up. I felt like I was dragging the church behind me, and it was more than I could bear. And I actually told God, I can't do this anymore. And uh, I said, you're going to have to do something, or I, I can't do this. And so in that process, God did speak, and uh, he gave me what I'm going to give you today. And I pray that it would be something that when the birds are circling around you and the fish are waiting, and it's getting difficult and hard, that uh, something will click. And, and I pray even more that, that this will be something that becomes a part of your daily life. Because I think it's the only way anybody's going to survive in this thing called ministry, particularly in these days. Now, my time is really short today. And so I want to, I'm going to, you have to listen fast. <laughs> because I don't talk very fast. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to have to do this the best that I can. Um, and, uh, and so I would also tell you that this is kind of the secret to spiritual awakening as well. Uh, we live in very exciting times to be in ministry, but they are some incredibly strange days. Uh, we saw coming in that there's a parking lot. One was the women's parking lot. You women like that? I asked James, I said, where's the gender neutral parking lot? 
come on, we're so open-minded we've lost our brains in our world today. Uh, but it's an exciting time because the potential for spiritual awakening is absolutely incredible. And I will tell you that every spiritual awakening in the Bible and historically began with people under 30. Is that most of y'all, right? And so, man, I think you, your generation holds the key uh, to seeing God do a great spiritual work in our life. That's what I'm praying for, a great awakening. Well, please find in your Bible Philippians 2, 1 through 12. I call this uh, the secret, and, and it really is. You'll uh, be aware it's a very familiar passage. I've found there's two kinds of churches. There are those that are vibrant, growing, making the most of their opportunities, and others that are disjointed and are struggling. Basically, there's two kinds of people, people who are struggling uh, through their life, others who seem to have a, a great joy and perspective, and I think the difference is some have discovered the secret and others have not. You got that passage? So let me read it for you, verses 1 through 11, Philippians chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind in you among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The secret. This passage answers some questions. If, then, and how. Kind of the foundation of a secret, the implication of a secret, and the application of the secret. And so let's begin verse 1, the basics of the secret. It's the foundation. And the grammatical construction is, if these things are true, and they are, is implied. It could be translated, since these things are true. And he mentions four things that are true because we have connected ourselves with Jesus Christ. First, he says there's courage, encouragement from being united with Christ, called alongside of, the Lord is with us. And I would tell you that we have a whole lot more courage and strength when we know we're not by ourselves. A cord of two strands is not easily broken. And so we have this courage, this hope, and this confidence because we are connected, uh, united with Christ. Spurgeon put in uh, his little testimony when he was saved, and I love the way he did it. He said that he looked at him, and he looked at me. And we were one forever. Man, that is an incredible connection. And so let me, uh, I'm Baptist, right? Baptists historically like to vote. So <laughs> we vote on everything. Now we've quit voting at our church. But man, I'm telling you, Baptists like to vote. Let's get us a vote in here. You want to vote? How many of you would say, I found some courage because I've been united to Christ? We get Unanimous on that? All right, that's good. First point is made. Secondly, he said, <laughs> secondly, he said, this is the basics. There's comfort that comes from his love. Soothing of pain. And I will tell you that at some point, everybody's life caves in. Your life will cave in. And oftentimes, the only source of comfort that we get is from Jesus Christ. And I cannot describe adequately the comfort of the master's touch. And so let's vote the second time. Have any of you found comfort from the love of Jesus Christ in your life? All right, we're two for two. 
Now, I'm, I'm hurrying through this, you realize, right? Third, there is a connection, a participation or fellowship with the Spirit. It's all in verse 1. And so we have this connection with friends. We have a connection with fellow members of the body of Christ. You know, what's good about this today is we all have a connection, a fellowship that ties us together. And the common denominator is Jesus Christ. And yet there is a greater connection, and that is with the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know how any other preacher does it, but here's what happens to me. Uh, I'm really freaked out about preaching. And if you do preach, you should be freaked out too because what you say impacts people for eternity. And so if you're off base a little bit and they hear you and they believe what you said but you were wrong, your accountability before God is going to be huge. And that's why you stick to the Bible. And so that, that, is, that is bothersome to me. And so... Uh, every Sunday morning, I get up really early, and I, I say, man, I don't know if I'm up for this today. And our early worship service is at 8 o'clock, and so I go in there, and I'm kind of nervous about preaching. I always get nervous when I preach. I'm nervous today. I got these theologians in here, and they're judging me as I preach. <laughs> That's not right. Where did he get that from? I can't wait to get to class. I'll correct that. <laughs> but anyway, so you, you, you get in the worship service and you begin to praise God a little bit. And man, there comes a little bit of a stirring and stuff. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit starts to work. And so by the time it's time, I'm ready. Because there is this, this connection that comes from being in the Holy Spirit. How many of you have found that fellowship that comes from being in the Spirit? We're three for three. We are on pace to be in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> the fourth is compassion. Uh, affection and sympathy. God understands. Nobody else may understand, but God does. The Lord Jesus Christ knows. One of the favorite stories that I've ever come across was from a, a kid it's a pretty long time ago. He uh, lived out in the country, and one of his neighbors had had, uh, had some dogs that were really high-quality hunting dogs and had some for sale, some pups. And so the little kid went over there and had his money in his pocket and said, I'd like to buy one of your dogs. And the man said, son, you can't afford uh, these dogs. These are very expensive dogs. He said, well, can I, can I play with one of them? He said, play with the, I said, sure. So called out the pups and out came the mom. And so he's playing with the little dogs. And finally another one comes out and he's got a, a, a bad leg, kind of messed up leg. He can't get around very good. And so the kid says, well, mister, this dog, he's probably not too expensive. You think I could buy him? And the man said, son, you don't want that dog. He's not going to be able to run, play with you like you'd like. You, you don't want that dog. And a little boy raised up his pants leg and showed him a prosthetic leg and said, well, he won't be able to run like the other dogs, but he's going to need somebody who understands. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ understands. And there is comfort that comes and compassion. So let's vote on that one too. How many of you have found that to be true? All right, we hit four for four, and you don't realize it, but you just got trapped. Because if these things are true, then we hit the implication. And uh, I would call it the building of the secret. And that's in verse 2. The implication is to strive for unity. And in attaining unity, you make everybody's joy complete. Has everybody been to the Alamo? Yes. The Alamo started out as a church. It became a battleground. And today it's a museum. And I will tell you, there are a lot of churches and ministries that started out right. <laughs> but they became a battleground. And now they're museums. <laughs> Southern Baptists are predicting 15 to 20,000 churches are going to close their doors in the next 10 years. And so we're, we're missing the secret. So there's three parts to the secret. One, he says, be of the same mind, have the same precepts. A way of thinking 
It incorporates the will and emotions into a comprehensive outlook that affects the attitude. Same values, same convictions, and I want to tell you, they've got to be biblically based. And this school is based on the premise that the Bible doesn't contain the Word of God, but that the Bible is the Word of God. And there is a huge difference in those two phrases. And so God is a perfect God. He's not going to give us an imperfect revelation of who He is to us. And so the Bible is truth. Jesus is the ultimate truth. Now, we can have theological difference while embracing a whole lot of different methods. That's what you've got to convince the old people in your church about. That methods aren't the key here. The key is the underlying truth. And if you've got everybody together on this page then you're, you're moving toward this secret. Now here's, uh, I'm sure you all have come across this, it's an American religion. Uh, it's been called moralistic therapeutic deism. It's what everybody believes in America. A God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Man, they'll agree to that. God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Yes, sir, I believe that. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. That's what you're up against. The next one, God does not particularly need to be involved in one's life except when needed to resolve a problem. This is American religion. And then good people go to heaven when they die. All those sound good, but every one of them are false. And so that is, that is the American religion that we face. We come against that together with one mind, standing upon the principles of God's Word. Then there's partnership. Be of the same love. If we get theology right, without love, we're going to have a cold, dying religion. If we get the love right and not the theology... We're going to be chasing after every fad that comes along. But I'll tell you, the key to success is that you'll just love one another. And I tell you, we got some guys who will be pastors. It's crucial from pastor to people. J.D. Gray was a great pastor, First Baptist, New Orleans. He said, New Orleans first got in my hair, then on my nerves, and last on my heart. And brother, when a city gets on your heart, you're stuck. Adrian Rogers, when he was pastor at Bellevue, he told them over and over again, if I love God and you love God and we love one another, there's not much the devil can do to stop us. And I'll tell you, nothing could be, uh, nothing could be more true. I tell my people that all, all of the time. Back when I was in seminary, we had a guy that has pastor of a country church up near the Oklahoma border, and he, was, he had a square dancing commitment on Saturday night. And so he said, I don't want to get up and go preach with you. And I said, absolutely. So I went up to his church. And um, I got there, and plenty of time, nobody was there. About 30 minutes after the Sunday school start, they started coming in. Had about five minutes in Sunday school. Uh, got ready for worship. And the little old church was packed. And then they said, we don't have a song leader today. Preacher, can you lead the music? And so I said, well, sure. How hard can it be? You just stand there and swat flies, right? <laughs> and so, uh, I'm young. I'm going to be innovative, right? And uh, Baptists singing out of the hymnal, you have verses, one, two, three, and four. Baptists don't sing verse three. <laughs> Some of you old guys know what I'm talking about. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Now, as a kid, I always wondered, what's wrong with verse 3? <laughs> 3 must be Methodist. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so anyway, I'm young and I'm innovative. And so I say, okay, when we sing this song, hymn number, whatever, we're going to do 1, 2, 3, and 4. Man, we're getting outside the box. So if you're leading music and you, you're doing an old school, when you bring your hand down, it's when they start singing, right? So we, verse 1, great, verse 2, and then I stopped them and I said, okay, now then, verse 3. Brought the hand down and I took off on verse 3. <laughs> well, there was an old woman sitting on that side of the building. She's not going to sing 
verse 3. She takes off on verse 4, and I'm doing 3, and the congregation has a decision to make. <laughs> Are they going to go with me on verse 3 or and deal with her? Or are they going to go to verse 4, and I'm going to leave and never come back? Well, they all went to verse 4. <laughs> so I'm left hanging, and I joined with verse 4 too. Well, I made a commitment that day to never lead music again. <laughs> but you know what? Listen, if they had loved me, they'd have done verse 3, no big deal. If I had loved them, we just wouldn't have done verse 3 anyway. Because is it that big a deal? So I'm telling you, if you got the love going for one another, that's going to cover an awful lot of faults. Then there's one more. There's united in purpose, in full accord and of one mind. The one purpose that holds it together is fulfilling the Great Commission, making disciples. And that covers a multiplicity of stuff. You got to have people doing evangelism, personal evangelism. They call it confrontational evangelism, but it's really not confrontational. It's just telling somebody how to be saved. Relational evangelism has its place, but I don't see very many people getting saved in relational evangelism in the New Testament. They were just going to people and telling them how to be saved. Then you're teaching them. You're baptizing them. You're teaching them. And they're able to then lead somebody else. It's a cycle. And, and if that is the major emphasis of a church, you're going to find you're going to be so busy doing that, you won't have time to stumble over the stuff that churches fight about. Did I send y'all pictures? Do y'all have pictures back there? All right, put that first picture up. That's the first church I served as pastor. That's First Baptist, Gould, Oklahoma. God, when he said, let's call Jim Pritchard in the ministry, let's send him to some strange-sounding places. <laughs> Gould, Oklahoma. Man, I was so proud. We had about 70 people that went there. I would go back into the little study that was off the carport where we live. And, man, I couldn't have been more prouder than I was in the Oval Office. Well... Um, one of the old farmers that had retired struck oil. And he came to me, and you'll notice there's about 13, 14 steps up that door. You have funerals, you walk, the preacher, they say, walk in front of the coffin. And, uh, man, I had these old men carrying the coffin down those steps. There's no way I'm going to walk in front of that <laughs> coffin down those steps. <laughs> so anyway, the old building was falling apart, and uh, this guy said, look, I will give all the money from these oil wells to build us a new building. And I said, awesome. We started an account. We went to the church. We voted. We like to vote, right? <laughs> there were eight no votes. And it happened to be four couples who were gazillionaires, whose family had owned the land ever since man had owned that property out there in southwestern Oklahoma. And they were the key people. And so the man was putting money in the bank. And we went out and did some work to get ready for it. But, man, every step we got stopped because of those eight people. So I went to the lady who was kind of the ring leader of them, and she's a great woman. And I said, why are you all opposed to this? And why are you stopping this from happening? And she said, my parents <coughs> were saved, baptized, and married in that church. And buried in that church. And me and my husband, we were saved baptized and married in that church. Our kids were saved, married, baptized, and we're going to be buried in that church. So it wasn't the church. She's talking about it was a building. You know the building's not a church, right? And so I looked at that, and I said, fine. What happened was she had severed the church from its purpose. God didn't give us a church so you could say, I've been saved, married, baptized, and buried there. So I had a call to go back out for a funeral. I drove by the church to kind of take a look at it, and here's what I found. Boom. Gone. When the last of those eight died at the funeral, they had about five members left. And so they just 
stumped the church down into the basement area, covered it up. And so I want to tell you, a lot of churches are in the process of dying because they've been severed from the very purpose for their existence. Now, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you, but it's absolute truth. A cockroach can live for as long as a month with his head cut off. Google it. <laughs> okay? So he cut his head off and he keeps living for a month. A lot of churches have been severed at the head from their purpose for existence, and they're still going through the motions, but they're dying. And so I want to tell you, as we look at the implication of the secret, we've got to be united in our purpose, precepts, and in our love, and in our purpose. I've got to give you this quote. It's a money quote. It's from a guy named Carl Bates. It's kind of a little side street, but it's a good place to stick it in. And it's powerful for me, and I like it, so I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> Carl Bates said, There was a time in my life when I earnestly prayed, God, I want your power. Any of you ever prayed that? No? I have, man. I prayed it all the time. He said, Time wore on and the power did not come. One day the burden was more than I could bear. God, why haven't you answered that prayer? God seemed to answer back with his simple reply. With plans no bigger than yours, you don't need my power. Man, I want to tell you something. If your plans include God's purpose of fulfilling the Great Commission, he'll pour the power out you need for it. The Great Commission, you know, he says, I'll be with you always. Some people take that out of the context of that verse, but he's connecting that to fulfilling what he said to do. Make disciples. And as you're making disciples, I'm with you. And so I'm just telling you, tie your life to making disciples. Now, that gets us to the implications. I want to go to the third, and that is the blessing, and that is kind of the application. Those verses 3 through 11 describe the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the principle of the key verse. Uh, quoting from Vance Havner, We don't need anything so new as much as we need something so old that it would be new if anybody ever tried it. <laughs> and so it begins with the desire, and the desire is to know God. Period. Many of us want to know God's blessings. And we want to have a really big influential ministry. But I want to tell you, the secret to it is not any of those things. It's just to know Him. That's the desire. To know God. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm thirsty. Because the more you get to know of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you want to know. And the more you learn about Him, the more you love Him. And so a desire. And then there's a deliberation. You can probably quote this verse, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so I have discovered that I have to quote that verse to God and to myself every day. Because it allows us to get off the throne of our life and put Jesus Christ on the throne of our life. And what happens to me is somehow during the day I have a tendency to crawl back up on the throne. But as we, as we make that confession of faith, we find that God brings it into reality and makes it absolutely true. And I'm telling you, we can last only so long in our own strength, usually about two to three years, then we wear out and we get to where I was at that church I was serving in Arkansas. I can't do this anymore. And so back at that point in my life, I began to go to the Scripture, and I came to these truths, and I said, Dear God, I've been preaching this, I've been teaching this, but I haven't been doing this. So it wasn't my church to pull. It wasn't my church to make successful. It belong, the church belongs to Jesus Christ. And so when I began to quote that 
and consider myself dead to sin and alive to God, I will tell you the flesh began and I rediscovered that God can do more in one millisecond than we can do in a thousand lifetimes. That's the key to the secret. Not I, but Christ. So we have preferences in music. We have preferences in ministry. We have preferences in all kind of things. But if we learn to take the preferences through Galatians 2.20, then I guarantee you we're going to discover the deliverance. Man, God sets you free. He'll set you free. The anointing comes. Someone has well said, Western civilization goes the way of the United States. The United States goes the way of Christianity. Christianity goes the way of the churches. And the churches go the way of the pulpit. I want to tell you, we got to get the secret going in the pulpits of our churches. Not I, but Christ. We've lost our relevance in our day. We've lost our voice, our impact, our culture, our country, because we've lost the secret. We've got technology. We've got brilliance. We've got theology. Technology, creativity, but what we lack is the anointing of God's Spirit upon our lives. And that will only come by discovering and applying the secret. Not I, but Christ. One last note. I'm kind of proud of myself, man. I'm going to be done close to 20 after. (laughs) Our greatest need in America today is spiritual awakening. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And I will tell you, once the fire starts, nobody can stop it. And, and I'm just telling you, maybe the fire can start right in here. When we were living in Arkansas, we had built a new house for the preacher to live in. They called it a parsonage So we'd been in about two weeks, and there was a lot of the construction trash out in the yard and stuff. And so I decided it's time to get rid of that. So I piled it up in a pile and was getting ready to burn it. And uh, James was about five. His little brother was three. So we're three men going to burn fire. Manly stuff burning fire, right? (laughs) So I'm getting ready to start the fire. My wife comes around the car. She says, Jim, you are a little bit windy today. You sure want to do that? When she said that, it offended me. I'm the man here. I know about fires. So that's what I told her. And I, that's, I'm, I guess God is my will. I said, look, I'm the man here. I know about fires. You go back inside and iron my shirts or something. She said, okay. So we start the fire. Man, we're standing around there, me and these two boys, we're... We're enjoying a fire. It's a good fire out there, boys. And then I noticed a little spot over here was burning. So I walked over and stepped on it. And there was another one. I stepped on it. Another one over there. I said, boys, y'all go start stepping on those things. <laughs> so we're out there stepping on these little piles of fire. So I said to James, go into your mama. Tell her I need a wet towel so I can beat these things out. So he went in, he came back, and I didn't see anything, and I felt some eyes on me. And I turned and she's standing at the corner of the house like this. I said, you gonna help me? She said, no, I got some shirts to iron. I promise you, man, I'm not making this in the preach story. This is true. So, <laughs> that's what my wife did to me. Now, she's a mean woman. <laughs> and so, we're sitting there still trying to do that. And then one of the boys says, look, Daddy. And up in the top of one of those um, pine trees was a fire. Call 911. <laughs> so we called 911, and, and in southern Arkansas, people didn't watch TV or listen to radio, they listened to the police scanner. <laughs> and it went on the scanner Preacher's house is on fire. 
here they came. They came on three-wheelers and four-wheelers, motorcycles, bicycles, pickup trucks, Cadillacs, and Jeeps. They got off their deathbed to come. <laughs> the preacher's house is on fire. Well, they came out. They put it out. No harm. No foul. My ego was destroyed. <laughs> and I got a great story to tell. By the way, preachers, most of your tragic things can turn into a great sermon illustration. You can live through it. <laughs> but here's the deal. Man, you get the little fire started. And God's Spirit kind of rolls through there and blows it a little bit. And you get a little spot over here. And man, a little fire starts at DTS. A little... Fire gets going out there at Forney, and then the little Holy Spirit wind takes it over here. And, man, before long, we, we got a fire. Man, they're going to start coming out of the woodwork to come see it burn. And so I would just tell you, not I, but Christ. That'll get the fire started. And we'll just trust God to let it spread. Thank you for letting me come today. God bless you.